<laughs> Hi, Hida. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everyone. Um, so happy that you're all here. Uh, I think a lot of people here either know Hida or know of Hida's work. Um, I had the opportunity to meet Hida a few years ago at our friend's, uh, mutual friend's wedding, uh, Kelly and Keelan, who are here. Um, I was immediately struck by her humor and intellect and warmth. And uh, I think all of that uh, comes through and so much more in your book, Born Both, uh, which just came out. <laughs> uh, they're available uh, behind you. Uh, I was uh, very honored to be able to read an advanced copy of this a few months ago. Um, and I was just so impressed by it and learned so much more about you and about uh, the intersex movement. So I'm really honored to be here. Um, I love our conversations. I feel like I never have enough time with you, but here we are. And you know what I always think? You know, we know what we really need is a captive audience. So, <laughs> Yay. so here we are. Um, I, I was thinking maybe as just a, a kickoff, we could do like a quick speed round, like a 101 speed round. I know these audiences in San Francisco are probably the most like progressive and woke audience we'll mm -hmm. ever find, but there may be some people who aren't totally familiar with all of these terms, and maybe some people listening that don't, you know, don't aren't aware of everything. So um, maybe just we can start off, Hita. How how do you identify? Wow, <laughs> can everyone hear me? I don't feel like this is on. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so I identify in a lot of different ways. So thank you for asking. I think. You know, my first strong identification was as a feminist and a Latina because I still, um, I didn't know I was intersex until much later. Um, and I'll read a little excerpt about that. Um, but yeah, I was very identified as a woman li living in an immigrant home. My parents are Colombian and Venezuelan immigrants and it was a very sexist culture and so I quickly became a strong feminist. And so <laughs> that was my, my earliest identification that was really strong. And it was both. I also felt very um, Latina. I didn't feel American. And it was obvious, you know, from our accents and, and everything that we weren't typically American. And today, flashing forward, I identify as a Latinx. Um, do you all, does anyone know that term, Latinx? Have you seen it? Okay, great. So I love that that term was invented. I can't take credit for it, although I feel like I should have invented it because I needed a term that wasn't having to, you know, that was gender neutral because Spanish is completely gendered. So it was very hard to, to communicate in Spanish. And I would be saying like, Latina O, like A slash O, you know, so that, so the, the X invention was great. And, um, and so today I identify as a Latinx gender fluid. That's a big part of my journey being gender fluid. Has everyone heard about gender fluid, what that means? It's, it's a gender identity term and it's people whose gender expression and identity shifts over time. So, um, it's become a little popular now, but I have to say that that was probably the most difficult part of my journey and to embrace really being gender fluid because people expect you to be stable in your gender and your gender presentation and your gender expression, right? So it was very difficult to come to terms and realize that mine just shifts and that is actually what is my true identity because I kept trying to choose. So a queer and so originally lesbian identified but then as i discovered i'm intersex the term lesbian doesn't exactly fit right so i personally love the term queer because it's gender neutral it means you're kind of gay in some way but not attached to an exclusive gender right so it's perfect for me so i'm a queer latinx gender fluid child of immigrants intersex activist and perhaps most importantly, writer, because that is really my true passion and I feel so blessed to be able to be doing it, um, you know, professionally. Excellent. Um, well, can you explain for someone maybe who has never heard the term intersex, what, is, what does it mean exactly to be intersex? Mm, yeah, good question. So the technical definition is intersex people are people who are born with sex characteristics, meaning chromosomes, gonads, testes or ovaries, or genitalia, which are not typically male or female, 
or which are a blend of both male and female characteristics. So, you know, the word hermaphrodite is what we used to be called, and most people know that term, so that's an easy way. I don't dislike that term personally, but um, many of my fellow community members do, so we prefer intersex. But I do like that the term connotes that there is a physical aspect going on because some people get confused about intersex, right? They think it's the same as transgender. They think it's a mental thing going on, but it's actually being born a certain way. Yeah. So what exactly is the difference between uh, being trans and being intersex? So um, being transgender means that your gender identity, how you feel as either a man or a woman or something else, non-binary person, it doesn't match the sex characteristics you were born with. So, you know, I mean, there used to be other ways of expressing this, but I think that's the most respectful way because as intersex people reveal, the terms male and female are not really, they're problematic. A lot of people fall outside of our understanding of what male and female is. And a lot of people that you might assume are typical Females and women, for example, could have XY chromosomes and internal testes, which means that that's one variation of intersex, which means you are chromosomally you know, and biologically male, and yet everyone perceives you as female and you're, you're gendered as female at birth because externally you appear female. So this concept of sex being exclusively binary is really false. You know, it was created because it's kind of what's more typical, you know, the majority of people fall into this, but there are many exceptions. So transgender people have an internal identification which doesn't match what our ideas are of what they should feel like with the sex characteristics they were born with, right? And intersex people just, they can have any gender identity, and we have all different gender identities, but we are literally born not male or female by the typical definition. So as a follow-up, can, can you be intersex and also identify as trans or ma male and female? Great question. Yeah, no, because people get confused. Yes, you can. And I have several friends who are both intersex and trans. And I will explain that to say that, for example, even myself and those who have already read the book know, um, I went through a period where people thought I was trans because I was assigned female when I was born. And, you know, they grew up as a typical girl, identified as a girl. But then later on, I started presenting as a boy wearing uh, men's clothing. And I thought I would look just typically lesbian. But actually, I started people started thinking I was a boy um, really exclusively. And so um, a lot of people thought I was trans because that looks like a trans trajectory, right? You grew up female. Now you're looking like a man, living like a man. And yet I was intersex. I had these physical characteristics from the start that were not typically female. So some people in my position with that experience identify as both intersex, how they were born, and also trans because their lived experience is you know, very similar to most trans people's. Um, I, you know, I don't, well, I, I sort of now have been included in the transgender umbrella because being gender fluid and being non-binary is part of the transgender umbrella, right. right? So you could say that I am both intersex and trans as well, although I kind of, um, I don't feel that I transitioned to anything, you know? So that's why I don't personally use that term. I just feel like I kind of learned to embrace what I always was. Yeah. Excellent. All right, everyone clear? We all caught up? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, I, I would love to just kind of do a little dive into your book, Born Both. Um, like I said, I had a chance to read it a couple months ago, and I was just struck by uh, so much of it. I think it's both such a, a personal memoir of your own story, of your, your life and your love and your family, and then a really um, a beautiful... Um, to the beginning of, of a movement and your, your career as an activist. So really recommend to anyone to, to, uh, to get it, to take a look. Um, maybe you could just start, e even just the prologue, I think, was a really 
a, a beautiful reflection of yourself an, as an adult thinking about your, your birth. Um, maybe you can share that with us. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, and it's really short. It's <laughs> telling. It's nice. My, my excerpts will be short so that we can be more in conversation. So, um, prologue. The darkest hour is just before the dawn is an old proverb that's intended to inspire hope in difficult or unfortunate times. The darkest hour is also the hour I was born, on May 29th, 1968, 17 minutes before sunrise. It turns out the saying aptly applies to my birth in more ways than one. But it would take me decades to realize this, decades to learn that my entry into this world was a moment of confusion that would raise questions about both my sex and my gender, the resolution of which was, unexpectedly, a blessing. For the first 20 years of my life, I thought I was, physically speaking, an ordinary girl. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm curious, what compelled you to write a book in the first place? What, what was it uh, that you hoped that people would um, take away from it? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I was always wanting to be an artist and I wasn't sure of the medium. And I, you know, tried different things and, and really loved them, but I decided writing was my strongest talent. And then I just felt like this was the strongest, the most important story for me to tell. You know, even though there could be things much easier <laughs> in terms of not having to reveal my entire soul um, than <laughs> writing a memoir, um, I, I just felt like if I was going to make the effort, it was the most important story. And when I say important story, I mean not just to spread understanding about intersex people in general, but also because intersex people are still today undergoing a gender side. So many of you are aware of this, but in case you're not, there are standard routine institutional efforts by the medical community to essentially erase intersex people from society. So when an intersex child is born and they are visibly noted to be different from typically male or female, it is called a social emergency. And there's like an immediate effort to correct them, quote unquote, to fit into the male or female binary. So that's what I meant earlier when I said that this binary is false, because you're literally carving up people's bodies and taking away their right to self-determination, to future um, pleasure and joy um, in order to maintain this false notion that everyone is male or female. So, you know, I felt that it was really important for me to share as someone who by luck and, you know, many different circumstances was not subjected to these procedures. I felt that it was so important for me to share why I'm happy that I was left as I am, <laughs> basically. Why, why do you think that you were, uh, you escaped having those kinds of surgeries? Well, in a nutshell, um, my dad is, um, let's see, he's going, to be, he's going to be 89 this year. So when he went to medical school in Columbia, these procedures literally had not been created yet. They were created around five years, I want to say, after he finished medical school. So um, that meant that A, he was a doctor when I was born, so they couldn't treat us in the same way, um, meaning that they couldn't give my parents false information about what my health status was, what surgeries I needed. You know, my dad knew. So it was like, you know, kind of this, this very fortunate thing that he was on the inside. And, um, and also, he hadn't been indoctrinated with this thinking because, remember I mentioned the sexist upbringing? Well, I think that had he been indoctrinated in medical school about the fact that these surgeries can you know, help people grow up to be heterosexual and normal in their gender expression, I think that he would have had it done because he was very attached to the status quo and to gender norms like many people from his generation and his culture and even today still are. 
So, yeah. yeah. So you pretty much dodged a bullet by a few years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Wow. Totally. Um, well, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your years as a girl growing up. Um, what was it like? When did you kind of first start to notice or understand that, you know, there was something different about you compared with other girls? It's <laughs> a really good question. And so um, I have a little excerpt I'm going to read about that. But what I want to say is that um, something that's really fascinating to me about being intersex is that it shows me firsthand that all of these notions we have about how children will feel about themselves, how people who are, quote, different will feel about themselves are really false. Um, and so I'm going to read this excerpt. And I think what's most striking about it is that despite the fact that I was becoming aware of this really significant difference, I didn't internalize it in a negative way. And I didn't really think of myself as, you know, I mean, the words that are used by psychiatrists and, and doctors about intersex people, and they're all presumptive and unsubstantiated with research, um, are to just simplify it, that we will all feel like freaks, you know, and, and not be able to exist if we're not surgically carved into the male or female binary. So. Um, I think that that is completely false. And I'm going to read a little excerpt that kind of touches on that. Okay. About a week later, during my follow-up visit, my doctor says, can I ask you a personal question? I guess so, I answer. Has your clitoris always been this large? I think back to the first time I remember noticing something was different about my genitalia. I didn't know the word clitoris yet, but I had noticed my thing and that it moved a little whenever I peed. It seemed like the stream was coming from it. In fact, I was convinced it was until I learned that only boys peed that way. So I decided to give myself a genital exam to find out what was going on. Of course, in an ideal world, I would have just asked my mom, but I knew I couldn't talk to her about such things. Privates are privates, she always said, and would hide hers whenever she changed while my siblings and I were in the room. She even made my little sister Eden and me hide ours from each other. I hadn't seen Eden's privates since she got out of diapers. I also never knew how my mom was going to react to things I told her. One time, when I was about four, I told her about how my best friend, who was a boy, asked me if he could kiss my butt and that I let him. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was so different from kissing my hand or my forehead. I just thought it was funny and that she would laugh like I did. But she started yelling at me. And then she did something I never imagined she would. She told my dad, I never saw the boy again. That said, it was best for me to figure out the pee thing on my own. I unplugged the desk lamp in my bedroom grabbed my pink plastic handheld mirror, and set up in the bathroom upstairs. I angled the lamp to act as a spotlight, stood over the toilet, and held the mirror in a way that I could see my privates in it. Then I let it rip. <laughs> it was hard to tell at first, but after a while I could see that the pee was actually coming from a tiny hole somewhere underneath my clitoris. I remember feeling disappointed for a moment. For some reason, I liked the way it moved and the idea that I was urinating out of it. But I also knew that it was better this way. I was a girl, after all, and girls were not supposed to pee like boys. In the examination room, the doctor clears her throat. Um, I don't remember any sudden growth spurts, I answer. So yeah, I guess it's always been, this, been large. I'd like to do some tests, she says with a strange look on her face. <laughs> Why, is there anything wrong? She pauses, looking down at my chart. Mm, you said on your form that you've had acne problems in the past. 
Yeah, but only briefly when I was in high school and not more than anyone else. And you also said that you have some facial hair on your upper lip, she continues, eyeing me closely. Well, yeah, but not more than most Latin or Mediterranean women. I just think it's a good idea, she insists. But why? Is there some kind of medical issue or something I should know about? I ask, confused. Not necessarily, she begins. I can tell that, for some reason, she seems re reluctant to answer my question. Well, she finally blurts out, it just isn't normal. I don't like the tone of her voice or the thinly veiled look of disgust on her face. She reminds me of the snobby people at the fancy restaurants my parents sometimes took us to when I was a kid. They weren't used to dark haired Latinos like us having enough money to mingle among them. And their expressions were far from welcoming. Well, I say firmly, feeling anger welling up. Since there's no medical issue, then no thanks. I don't want any tests. The appointment ends soon afterward and I leave knowing I'll never go back. Fuck her, I think, on my way home. <laughs> I know my body's different, but she didn't have to make it sound like I'm abnormal in a bad way. As much as I try to ignore these kinds of thoughts, though, her comments begin to fill me with nagging doubts over time, the way certain remarks can. I begin to think she is a doctor, after all, Maybe she knows something I don't. A few months later, I finally decide to see a gynecologist at the center, the Gay and Lesbian Community Center in Manhattan. They have a medical clinic with a sliding scale, and I figure their doctors will be more accepting. Um, you know how I told you about my ectopic pregnancy? I asked the doctor as she's wrapping up my routine gynecological checkup. Yes. Well... The doctor who operated on me said afterward that she wanted to do tests because my clitoris isn't normal, like I'm a freak or something, because it's as big as it is. Well, that wasn't a very nice thing to say, was it, she says. I'm relieved and grateful to see that she's a caring person. No, it wasn't, but do you think there's anything I should be worried about, I ask. If you want to lie back down, I'll check again, she says but your ovaries felt fine to me. That'd be great, I say, lying down. Yep, she says as she feels around, same as I thought the first time, perfectly healthy. Thanks for checking again. You know, she continues, looking me right in the eyes, genitals come in all shapes and sizes, and I think your clitoris is beautiful. Her, wor her words are as soothing as the Caribbean nurses in the hospital and I feel a tear of relief and gratitude roll down my cheek. I search her face for insincerity. So used to people like my dad who always look down on anything outside the status quo, but I can't find any. In the weeks that pass, I'm struck by the contrast in how the two doctors viewed me. One saw me as I see myself, perfectly healthy, with a variance in my genitals that's nothing to be ashamed of. Part of me wonders if this doctor said those things just to be nice, but it still feels good, especially since the other doctor had found me so strange. The way she had wanted to run tests makes me think of sci-fi movies where unusual beings are whisked off to government labs upon discovery. I have a vague sense of having narrowly avoided something but I have no idea mm. what. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that passage so much. And I think uh, it's something that, that a lot of people take for granted that uh, the doctor will just see them as, as normal. Um, wh what did that feel like to you to finally find a doctor that really treated you as a human being and you know, there wasn't something abnormal with you? I have to say, especially considering the stories that I heard later, I, I feel that it was like divine intervention. You know, I really feel so very lucky because so many of the other people that I've met 
poor intersex had very different experiences where all the doctors treated them as if normal. <laughs> and so much so that they came to see themselves that way. You know, so I had this experience which for the first time in my life, I had started to question like, well, maybe I'm too different or, you know, maybe there's a problem with this. And this second doctor like affirmed what I believed in, inside that it was fine. But I, I wonder, you know, and I've met some adults and it, it's so, I see this moment as so critical in my life because I've met adults who did get the test done and, and at the same age, at 19 or 20, and then were talked into having surgeries that mm. they now regret like decades later and, you know, ever since and for decades have been regretting. So I think that it was really important an extremely positive moment in my life. Yeah. So even at this time, though, you still didn't have a word necessarily for it. So yeah. you, when, when, uh, when did you finally hear the term intersex? And kind of what was that experience like? Did you have this kind of aha moment where <laughs> the kind of puzzle pieces came together and you, you said, this is me? Totally. Yeah. So I have a, a <laughs> nice San Francisco based passage about that. And, um, and it's funny that I know the exact moment and location where that happened, my aha moment, <laughs> on the 22 Fillmore bus, actually. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> which is funny, right? Um, but um, yeah, and it was, you know, I also, this is another example of how like all these presumptions aren't necessarily true because a lot of people talk about how, oh, if someone discovers their intersex, it will be this like horrible moment. And for me, it was actually like, it was strange, but it, it answered a lot of questions and it quickly became very positive. You know, there was the initial moment of surprise really. Um, and then it quickly became very, very positive because it, it answered all these, this confusion I had felt. So. With that, I will jump into this passage. Um, February 1995. I'm on the corner of 16th and Dolores Streets in San Francisco, waiting for the 22 bus. And as it pulls up, I grab a copy of the SF Weekly. On the cover is a picture of a person's face that looks half male, half female. The features seem pasted together, like a collage I might have created as a kid. The resulting visage is smiling, with huge eyes that seem all-knowing, yet at the same time, confused. The headline reads, both and neither. The words jump out at me from the cover. I walk to the back of the bus, take my place next to an old Chinese woman with a bag of groceries on her lap, and open to the article. It's about intersex a term I've never heard before, that refers to people who are born with both male and female traits, what some would call hermaphrodites. Both male and female traits. The bus lurches forward and I sit there, completely frozen. For a few moments, the time it takes to get to Market Street, the world disappears. Although I've heard of hermaphrodites, they seemed so rare that you'd never actually meet one. <laughs> like those yogis in the Himalayas that are rumored to be 200 years old. <laughs> this article, however, tells me that one in 2,000 people are born with genitals like mine, which they call ambiguous. That means intersex people are a lot more common than I thought. They are everywhere, in fact. And sometimes they don't even know they're intersex. They don't even know they're intersex. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> is this the word I've always lacked? Is this the word to describe my very private secret difference? The difference that's been, become more and more confusing over the years? There are two women interviewed in the article. One is about my age and looks smart and pretty in a slightly rebellious sort of way. She reminds me of the women with whom I went to Wesleyan. <laughs> Some of whom are here tonight. <laughs> but that's where the similarity ends. 
because both she and the other woman in the piece endured something the likes of which I'd never heard. Their clitorises were surgically removed. Their doctors had decided that they were too big and recommended cosmetic genital surgeries to their parents to help them fit in as women. But the women in the article said the result was just the opposite because the surgeries made them unable to orgasm. The thought of those little girls having forced operations gives me the heebie-jeebies, but the article says it's the standard treatment in the United States and other parts of the first world for babies born with ambiguous genitalia. I look up from the paper, shocked. The old lady next to me has nodded off peacefully. Her head bobs back and forth as the bus bounces over the pavement. She wakes up whenever there's a particularly bumpy patch, then drifts off again just as quickly. Her presence calms me. Life goes on, despite the craziness that has just unleashed itself from the pages of this newspaper. The women in the article sound a lot like me, and they're intersex. You could have put an article in front of me about aliens being discovered working in the White House, and it would have been less shocking to me than this information. <laughs> I mean, I've known that my body is different for a while, but to possibly be a hermaphrodite? And to learn that there's a worldwide medical effort to eliminate intersex people? It sounds like a frightening science fiction movie. There's a part of me going, nah, 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 can't hear you, because it's just so much to take in. I've been getting my period since I was 11. I must be a woman, right? And I've never had one of these surgeries. But at the same time, there's also a quiet, persistent voice in my head going, aha, I knew it. I remember several incidents in a flash. My mom's strange, they thought you were a boy comment. Thinking I peed out of my clit. Being asked if I have a dick. I didn't know there was even a word to describe someone who wasn't a typical woman. But now, I do. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, a big part of your book, you talk about the years that you spent here in the San Francisco area. Um, and I love so, so much about that part of the book. Um, something that you that's really fun to read, I think, is, is when you talk about your, your explorations of your own gender fluidity, and you're starting to really experiment with it. Um, you talk about you know, trying, going out for the first time really dressed in, with a male presentation and realizing that you could pass as, as a man. <laughs> I'm wondering if you can talk, just talk about what that felt like. What, what were the reactions that you got? Did people treat you differently when they perceived you male versus female? And how, how did you both play with your, your gender presentation and experiment with it? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> um, and I, I'm glad you liked it. This, it is a large part of my journey. Um, it was a large part. Um, and what and, a great place to be while you were. <laughs> I know. I feel so lucky I was here, you know, because I know intersex people from actually all over the world, all continents. And um, honestly, they are not as fortunate. You know, they're living in places where they could not do what I did. Yeah. And even when I traveled, there's a really good, uh, I'm not going to read from it, so I'll just say there's a, a chapter about my trip to Costa Rica and how difficult it was there because. I couldn't pass as a woman there the way that I was looking at the time, you know. And at times I wanted to just to have it be easier, you know, legally and, and in all different ways. And even when I was running around with a, a bathing suit top on, people <laughs> still thought I was a guy. And so I was getting a lot of hostility, you know, as someone who they thought was a man wearing a woman's bathing suit. And so... <laughs> And so when I got back to San Francisco after that trip, I was really grateful to live here. And that, <laughs> and that was 1997. And so um, I have a, a very short excerpt about that. And so I'll just say a little more that um, 
I think that's a really fun part of the book, and so hopefully some of you will read that. Um, but I'll just surmise it to say that all of my feminist theories about the difference between how women and men are treated in society, even progressive San Francisco American society, were true. <laughs> um, <laughs> and meaning that immediately I was assumed to be more intelligent, more competent in every way, in any way. And also, um, I was given more space. You know, if I spoke, people listened more. I didn't get, you know, kind of, you know, subtly ignored. People didn't decide to like, oh, it's time for me to go somewhere else, a woman speaking. Like, it was really all that. You know, like, I, I was just, I was unhappily unsurprised <laughs> at, you know, at the, yeah, just the level of difference. And, and it was, uh, but it was important for me, you know, to, because I wouldn't have known that firsthand, right? And we kind of have these assumptions and then we second guess ourselves and think, is that not true? Or is, are there different factors going on? And so, you know, I was the same person. I wasn't more intelligent and I wasn't more competent. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but and, I yeah. love that you say a lot of gay men hit on you. Yes. Oh, and that was <laughs> great. And uh, it was... <laughs> It was really fun, actually, and that was like a whole other, <laughs> it was a whole other really important part of my journey, too, because I got to experience a difference in, you know, sexual orientation in different groups that I would not have known. And it felt very different being hit on by a gay man who thought I was a man than it felt being hit on from a straight man who thought I was a woman. <laughs> And so, you know, and so that was really, really cool. And I'm so grateful <laughs> that I was able to experience that, honestly. And, uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's quite a chunk of this book talks about that time period. Um, but because we have limited time, I'm going to read a very short passage, which is timely um, given what's happening in the States right now. Oh, dear. The elderly woman who's just walked into the restroom says, looking at me, I guess I didn't look at the sign. No, you did, I say. But I'm a woman, I say, don't worry. She stares at me in disbelief as I walk past her on my way out. And I decide that that's the last time I'm using a woman's restroom. I've been using men's public restrooms about 90% of the time. And it's been a lot easier than I imagined since men don't stare at each other the way women do when they're in the bathroom. <laughs> the only challenge is when there are, are mm. only urinals, in which case I bail. It works, but, it is, but it's pretty weird for someone who has been female all her life and isn't taking testosterone. It's been three months since I stopped dressing like a girl, and I don't bother correcting people when they call me he or sir anymore. I did it every time at first because I felt compelled to broaden their idea of what women can look like. But now that it's starting to sink in that I might not be a regular woman anyway, it seems a little strange to force people to say she, especially when even my own girlfriend doesn't see me that way. And that is all I'm reading on that extra. <laughs> And seen. <laughs> and I do want to share, you know, people, a lot of people who met me before I adopted this new presentation, especially those people, um, and then people who know me now are honestly like really shocked, you know, and they're like, Shh, we don't, you can't look like a man. But I will just share that I really did. My friends of 20 years didn't recognize me, like, you know, about this close like did not recognize me. And it's all about thick eyebrows and, you know, like letting that upper lip hair grow in and where, you know, what you wear. It's really like in my case, but I think in many people's, depending on how you groom yourself, you can look more or less feminine or masculine or male or female. And so, um, and even my own mom didn't recognize me. And that was a really uh, wild experience because I was flying to New York. I'm originally from New York and I was visiting her and it was pre-cell phone, you know, so I couldn't tell her exactly where I was or whatever, but we had a, a spot. And um, I was a little early, so I was sitting there and I pulled out my book and I was reading 
And I just, I kept looking around and then she was late. And then and finally, I just saw this woman kind of whizzing back and forth. And I was like, mom! And she looks <laughs> at me and like her jaw drops. And she's like, you know, in Spanish, she's like, oh my God, I saw you like a bunch of times. I thought you were just a guy, a baron in Spanish, you know, like a young guy. And, and so, yeah, so, you know, my own mom, who obviously knows my face very well. But, um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, yeah, so that was that time um and then i think i'll well maybe you have a question about why that t i don't know like what happened i have all <laughs> kinds of questions <laughs> um i am wondering did you in addition to the brow and the clothes did you i mean did you also kind of adapt a bit of a swagger oh and that's a great question I'm, yeah i'm asking because i wonder if you saw in other guys that they also put on that performance a little bit you know it's not just it's a performance it's performative also with with men so did you did you kind of see that get some insight into that completely i'm so glad you brought that up yeah you know it's i think the gift of being intersex for me is just how it's made me able to really look at gender in a very different way you know and realize all these things like even though i was this staunch feminist you know, and I, at first I was correcting everyone, you know, and like, no, that's she, you know, and, and, and like being like, no, you know, like it, I'm a woman and, and women can be all different ways, which I believe. Um, I didn't think I was the type of person who would kind of adopt mannerisms, but it just kind of happened. You know, it's just like after a while when people perceive you as something, it's sort of unconscious that you kind of start becoming that thing, you know? So people were perceiving me as a guy, and so I was like, okay. And then I just, I kind of started like watching guys and like, oh, okay, I'm, they're a guy, I'm a guy, what do guys do? And, and like I, I <laughs> yeah. and, and I did, I adopted more, you know, and what's, what was, what, made it more natural and easier for me is I had always kind of been, um, it had been noted as I was a kid, and I don't see any here, but one of my friends is supposed to be, hey! Like, one of my childhood friends, I remember they'd make fun of me because I really swang my arms when I walked, and so I kind of had like more of a, probably what you would call masculinity to me anyway, you know, always, but I just like accentuated that. You know, so it was like, okay, now that I'm a guy, like, yeah, I'm gonna like do that swagger and I'm just gonna be in that, I'm gonna sit like that, and, you know, and all the things that I sometimes did and got in trouble with from my like very feminine Latina mom, um, you know, like all those like, like overly masculine behavioral traits that I sometimes had, like I just l let them out and it was really positive. So that was, yeah, really, interesting just to see how easy it is to become what society wants you to be did you have any um like music uh stars or like pop <laughs> icons that I, I feel like in the 80s and 90s there were so many more uh popular figures who really blurred gender and played with gender did you have any people that you i don't know were inspired by or intrigued by Yes, totally. And I even dedicate, like, one of the dedications is to Prince. <laughs> Rest in peace. Um, it, yeah, you know, I think that honestly, if I hadn't have grown up in the 80s with Bowie and Prince and Grace Jones, I think that my life would have been very different. I think that I would have been much more, um, I think I would have been suicidal in a serious way because I would have felt completely alone on the planet. Um, and they, you know, even though I didn't know them, even though they weren't openly queer or openly, you know, the, the, the terms that we have now that I'm so happy about, you know, the, the gender fluid community, the gender queer community, the non-binary community, everyone who is something other than typically man or woman, um, that didn't exist then. Right. So there was really no terminology and you were just this like, you know, gender bender, I guess, was the word, the phrase, the only phrase. Right. And um, and and so seeing people out there and who I also really respected musically <laughs> um, was amazing. And it was really what gave me self-esteem. I mean, having them as role models, like instilled that little grain and seed of hope 
and self-esteem that like, okay, even if the world is telling me I'm not supposed to be this way and even many members of my queer community at the time were very caught in the binary and the lesbian world was completely butch femme, you know, and everyone wanted me to choose one and, you know, decide which one I really was. Um, that was really, really difficult. And yet I had mm. these, these figures that I could, you know, look to and say, well, they're not doing it and I don't have to either. And so that, yeah, it was really important. I love that. Was, you know. Annie Lennox for me was another. Yes. Part I really love. Of course. I want to forget her. And it's funny, yeah. even those big, like, really um, masculine hair bands, you know, they were like, the, the dude rock was yes. also like they were wearing makeup and big hair. Totally. It was so weird. So much makeup. I yeah. wonder what's, I mean, have any of them come out? I wonder now, like mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole band Poison or Rat or whoever is now like out as gay. We'll have to but, do um, a follow up. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think you were running a little bit uh, late on time, but I know you had another, I think one more passage you wanted to share. Oh, yeah. Thank let's, you. Yeah, let's so, dive, dive into it. Yeah, thank you. And I, we're actually really pretty good, I think. Um, so, I, I wanted to um, just say that what's really lovely is that after feeling, you know, all this pressure, right, and kind of, I, I call them my gender surfing years when I was really like just playing with gender expression and gender roles and trying out different things. And again, I'm very fortunate that I was living in San Francisco where I could do that safely. Um, <laughs> Then I, I had a shift, which I actually prayed for because I felt so tortured for quite a few years about not knowing what my true gender was. It really, living in this binary world, it was torturous to feel at times very feminine and then wake up, you know, two days later and feel completely masculine and just not, you know, know and, and have everyone around me choosing, you know, and many of the people that I was with in the late 90s ended up transitioning, which is, you know, was great for them. But I felt like I did. I felt like I didn't want to change who I was, but I was just so confused about who I was. And so it was actually the Burning Man community, <laughs> which I see someone here from that community, and I'm very happy, um, that kind of helped, assisted me in this whole process because, you know, as many of you know, Burning Man started in San Francisco, and um, I had a friend who was very involved in that community who ended up being um, my roommate and taking me out to these things, and I finally went to my first Burning Man in 2000, and so um, I had this, this moment there, which I feel like was really one of my important moments in beginning to embrace being gender fluid before that was, you know, a known identity. So I'm just going to read a short passage about that. After riding around for a bit longer, I learned that Jared is a DJ, and he knows a lot of other DJs at the festival. He takes us to where one of them is spinning. The guy's name is Lauren, but he's known by his stage name, Bass Nectar. And it turns out he's amazing. His music is some of the coolest dance music I've ever heard. And I was into the early 90s SF underground outdoor dance party scene before they were called raves. So I've heard a lot of good DJs in my day. While listening to him, I danced my ass off and my thighs off and my feet off. I dance my way into another dimension, a dimension where I'm not dancing along to the music. I am predicting the music. I'm one step ahead of it, pouncing on every beat like I know exactly when it's going to drop, like the DJ and I are telepathically connected. Through the glorious haze of my dancing, I notice that people are staring at me, a lot of girls in particular, and I like the expression on their faces. <laughs> I feel like I'm a magnet for both curious and beautiful girls and boys. I'm wearing these low-rise velvet pants with a psychedelic pattern that I got with Beth ages ago at Patricia Field, our favorite clothing store in the village. My top is a child-sized Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles t-shirt <laughs> that I pulled and stretched till it was big enough for me to squeeze into. 
The bottom makes it just past my breasts. So you can see my whole stomach, which is looking more cut than usual with the water loss I've experienced over the past 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> I look very, is that a boy or a girl? Some things about me are sexy in a womanly way, like my smooth skin and the way my body moves. But then I'm also flat chested and more muscular than most women, with small hips and an aggressive masculinity to some of my dance moves. My energy moves back and forth from masculine to feminine and everywhere in between. It seems to mesmerize the crowd. Most people can't stop staring and gravitating toward me. Although the boys can tell I'm a dyke, so they keep a respectful distance, God bless them. <laughs> However, I throw some love at both the girls and the boys, because I can tell they see me for who I really am. I'm an andro freak, and that's freak in a good way. And they obviously love it. I remember Jade saying my androgyny is the very thing that makes me attractive. As usual, I think she was right. Well, that's it. <laughs> <clears throat> um, a few more questions, just kind of big picture looking forward. Um, can you talk about some of the main issues facing the intersex community now? Thanks. Yeah, so I feel really blessed that this book is out and it might give <coughs> The impression that, you know, things are really great for intersex people and, you know, we're getting this positive attention. Um, and I mean, in, in a certain way, yes, right, because of the reception for this. However, I have to stress that right here, just five minutes away at UCSF, these, quote, corrective, end quote, surgeries are still happening, mm -hmm. right? Intersex genital mutilation, as many activists like to call it, because some of the surgeries, like clitoral reduction surgeries, are exactly the same as the surgeries called female genital mutilation, um, has not decreased. And part of that is the strength of the medical establishment in the US, right? And you know, we're not the only community that's been impacted by this. And I like to remind myself of this when it seems really depressing, is that you know, care and treatments and unnecessary medical treatments are really on the rise in, in a lot of ways. And so that is one of our biggest challenges, is that unlike the LGB community, who doesn't have you know, this, this kind of medical institutionalized discrimination to deal with, we have this going on, you know, still. Um, to be positive, though, I will say that I'm getting an increasing amount of emails from parents who have decided not to operate on their children. Yeah. And, yeah. So that's... And, and Kita, what, what, what do you want parents to know from your experience? You. What do you really want them to know if, if, you know, parents who've never heard about intersex before, but suddenly they have an intersex infant? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I want him to know that it's really so minor of an issue in my life that many friends who like knew me before I came out as intersex, right, and, and was just living as a presumably regular woman, were almost surprised by the level of activism you know, that, that I became involved with. Because to them, it appeared like, well, you're just this normal person. I don't get it. What's this movement or what do you, like they literally didn't get, you know, the difference which doctors predict is so horrific that we have to carve up a baby's genitals, you know, against their will. And, and by the way, I'm against all genital cutting. So, and you know, I'll just, well, leave it at, we are at the JCC, but I will just say that. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,
<laughs> Sorry, JCC. But I do <laughs> I do want to say that I think that every, I think that everyone deserves the right to determine what happens to their own genitals, you know, and to self-determine their identity. And, um, and so um, I just want parents to know that it, it doesn't have to be a big deal at all, you know? And for me, actually, it wasn't a big deal uh, until I met these other adults. I was, I was thinking I would meet other adults who were like me and share the stories of growing up in this different body and actually share wonderful stories of my unique sexual experiences, you know, that were incredible, you know, based on, on how I was born. And instead, I met the most traumatized group of people that I have ever encountered. Um, and I was honestly, I barely spoke the entire weekend. And there's a really powerful chapter about that in here called Gender Side, because I discovered that there was a movement to eliminate people like me from the planet. And I just could not believe the stories that I was hearing and the experiences, because here's another thing that parents really should know is it's typically not just one surgery because babies obviously are growing, right? So body parts stretch and things come apart and it's, you're basically, you know, people who, you know, agree to these procedures are signing their children up for a lifetime of being medicalized and having all these doctor's visits that they don't understand because they're babies and then infants and then young children. And it gives them an incredible sense of shame about who they are because their siblings aren't going through it. You know, their classmates aren't going through it. I know one person who had to lie every summer of his childhood, you know, and make up things like, well, I broke my arm and, you know, just so now, all of this <coughs> terrible psychological impact, which I do not have an ounce of, right? And so the hardest part for me, which does not exist for children today, for anyone being born today, was that the internet didn't exist and the information that's out there now about intersex didn't exist. So the real, the only difficulty that I had was like, sensing, you know, that I was different and just not having a language for it or a way to, you know, conceptualize myself, that was challenging. And yet still I managed, like the other people I know who are blessed to be left intact, I managed to develop a healthy identity despite all the ignorance and, you know, and being different. And then the people I know who, and which is sadly the vast majority, who are subjected have such a completely opposite experience. And they constantly use the word shame to refer to intersex. It's almost become synonymous with most intersex people, this word shame. And you still see it in a lot of articles because that is what being medicalized imposed upon them. You know, and I would say, you know, love your child and spare them from this horrific experience of feeling inferior and feeling shame about that very special part of their, you know, adult life, you know, give them the, the option to really experience the joy of being who they are and, you know, and, and the option to change that if they want later, you know, some people, as we know, with the trans community may want to change the sex characteristics they were born with, but that should be your choice, right? So give your child the, the choice to, to be who they are. Great. Yeah. And then, finally, just real quick, maybe talk about just some uh, other issues that are important for intersex adults and here and now. What about uh, workplace discrimination or issues with identification, um, documentation, stuff like that? Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, so, I'll quickly say that all of the, the challenges that we face can really be decreased by people beginning to incorporate us into your conversations. I think the enormous difference, and by that I mean saying things like men, women, and intersex people, and not just limiting it to men and women, because in fact there is a whole group of the human population which is as common as redheads, we are statistically, that statistic I read of one in 2000 only refers to people with ambiguous genitalia. 
but there are the chromosomal variations I mentioned and many different types and there's a huge range there's about 30 known variations and uh, everywhere from people who look very female to very male or in between and when you take all of us together we are as common as having red hair we're 1.7 percent so you know you all know intersex people even within your your personal lives i'm sure and yet the thing that i know firsthand that's so difficult about coming out as intersex that is so much harder than it was i mean i didn't have a hard time at all coming out as a lesbian even though it was still not you know positive in 1986 when i came out i mean it was far from positive but I, I was rebellious and I just believed in the golden rule and that everyone is equal. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'm, this is how I am. And I know God loves me anyway. And I was kind of religious and I had my concept of God, um, which I call the universe. And, um, and so I really believed that I was equal and it didn't matter at all. But what was easy about that in comparison was that everyone knew what a gay person or a lesbian was. So I could come out and I didn't have to give a biology lesson, you know, and like suddenly, you know, watch people's look of surprise and deal with all these questions, like just to share who I am. Right. So like, imagine that. Imagine if every time you shared a very, very basic fact about yourself, people were like, oh, my God, what is that? I didn't know that existed. And, blah, blah, blah. and now you're you know, you literally like and I and I'm extremely out and I like to come out whenever I can. But sometimes I don't have the time because I know <laughs> <laughs> because I know that it'll entail this conversation with most people, you know, well, and now so, we have a book. I know. Yay. <laughs> You and can just so, hand these out at parties. I know. And so I went, yeah, right? You know, read this and you'll know. No, but, but like, so I'm sharing all that just to say that if you all just began to say male, female, intersex, men, women, intersex people, and then I'm like, yeah, you know, guess what? Not everyone's born male, female. That would assist the intersex community so much because the challenges that we face, which Sam asked about, are things like the TSA. I have a hassle every time I go through the security scanners because they were designed with only males or females in mind. And I wrote a piece about it recently for the Daily Beast, which is like, when you, when I go through, when anyone goes through, and many people don't know this happens, it's literally on the TSA website, the agents press a pink or blue button. Yeah, when you go through that scanner based on, on which gender they think you are or which biological sex, however way you want to call it. Um, and then they, the scanners are programmed to detect only male or female genitalia and sex characteristics, right? So I, I used to think at first when I started realizing something was happening, this began in about 2010, the scanners and I thought, oh, I wonder which button they pressed for me, you know, but then I realized that no matter which button they pressed, you know, like literally no matter which button they press, my body sounds an alarm, literally an alarm. And, and so, and the alarm tells them they need to check this area. There's a, a screen. And if you go through and you look back, you'll see the screen. And on the screen, whenever I go through, there's a red box right over my genitals. And I, it's so funny. Some of them are used to it, but I, like even flying over here now, I saw the agent and they're looking at the box and they're like, oh no, what does this mean? And, then, and I'm like, I'm laughing because I'm like, oh, I know what it means. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, but they're like, so, you know, but, you know, I, fortunately I have a good sense of humor, but there was one time recently which motivated me to write the piece where the agent was really cruel, like actually cruel and got crueler when I said, you know, very politely and friendly, so, since I'm so used to it, like, you know, oh yes, do whatever you have to do. I have a flight I'm trying to catch. She slowed down. And, you know, to just deliberately try to make me miss my flight, called the supervisor. And then while going over the whole spiel about all the many different clothing parts and body parts I'll have to touch, just had this really cruel look on on her face and you know it felt honestly and as a survivor of sexual abuse and you know many different forms i can say it felt abusive and it was really um a difficult emotional experience and so um 
you know, none of this would exist if everyone who, if the people who created these scanners had been educated enough to know that intersex people existed, right? And they could have just like mapped that into their criteria. So essentially, you know, and workplace discrimination, we're not covered. Um, right now we are on the brink of being legally recognized. Like it, it is beginning and it's wonderful. Um, my colleague at my organization, OII USA, um, we discovered they had a very good, they used they, them pronouns, they had a very good legal case for being issued a non-binary passport because their birth certificate said sex unknown, which is very rare, but occasionally that was written before they decided which one to you know, correct it to. And then they have all these papers from the VA saying they're intersex, that they're a Navy veteran. And so these are two government documents, right? Which most of us do not have um, because they're trying to put us into each box and not acknowledging that we're intersex. And so they, it's, long story short, they sued, they won, and the federal government had to acknowledge that, that intersex people exist. And it's also based, by the way, in a very coalition, the lawsuit was done in coalition with the LGBTQ community where it was very clear that this is not simply because Dana is intersex. This is because Dana is intersex physically and also identifies as neither male or female, right? Because we don't want people to have to be, you know, again, another gender policing, like, well, only people who have intersex genitals or body parts can be non-binary. You know, I, I believe that gender is whatever you feel. You know, it's not related to your body parts. So the law is consistent with that as well. However, and the beauty of the coalition is that the judge was able to understand this in a way they never would have really just with a, a typically male or female person. You know, there's a lot of resistance to non-binary identity, right? People are like, oh, whatever, you're making this up. You're really a man or a woman. The fact that Dana was physically neither male or female is what really made this a strong case. So, and, so, and then shortly after, a colleague of ours got... Um, petitioned California and was the first non-binary Californian, I know this person, and they happened to also be born in New York City where I was born, and so they received the first intersex birth certificate, was issued last December, and um, I have applied for mine and have been, you know, getting the emails that it should come shortly, so I think I'll soon have the second. Yeah, they kind of, so this is a really positive thing, however, However, we won't, you know, the government, even though the lawsuit was successful and said that the State Department has to issue the passport, then our administration changed. <laughs> and, and so who knows, you know? And, and we actually, there was a conference abroad that I, I wanted Dana to go to for my org because I have a book event that I've committed to and I can't go, an important intersex conference, and they did not issue the passport. And they're stalling, and of course they are. And so really what we need is society to acknowledge intersex people, right? Because as we know, you know, laws mimic the social the framework, the social awareness, social consciousness of the moment. And so we need people to really be talking about intersex people and welcoming us into conversations and, and acknowledging our existence for all these laws to change. Otherwise, it's very easy to, to keep things where they are because you know, when adults complain and say this was done to me or, you know, or even try to say that there's a human rights abuse going on against intersex people, the typical medical response is like, oh no, they're not. Those people are just males or females with this certain disorder that we had to help fix, right? So, so there's like, all of these attempts to just eliminate us, you know, by, by maintaining this binary and just saying like, well, there's this rare exception, but they can be fixed. Well, I think your book is a big, big step forward. So, um, <laughs> Thank you, Sam. I wanna open it up. Peter, uh, to open it up to the audience. Anyone has some questions? There's uh, one right here in the, the front. Yeah. Sorry. 
Um, I, I am, am a, a, a new mother of a transgender daughter who is 27, who it was not a parent growing up, even for her. And, and I'm, I'm learning all about this world. And, and when you talk about intersex, she identifies as female, is legally a female now. She has transitioned through hormone um, um, therapy. But she has chosen to not have sexual reassignment surgery. And what she faces going through the um, TSA, where there is a man who has to feel her crotch. And when they say, what is that in your pants? And she says, that's my dick. And oh, you know, and she's not being, but, and so my, my question is, is as I'm watching her navigate this world and, and being proud of who she is, and um, I'll, I'll say it here, you want us to share all this stuff. She is so great, she says, I'm a chick with a dick. And that, you know? <laughs> And that's what I like, and I'm beautiful. And so when you talk about the rights and, and what's happening in the intersex community, I'm, I'm curious about that term. Is that only for people who were born that way? Because there is a generation that's going to be living that way proudly. And, mm -hmm. and those rights and, and, and where you see that going is my question. Yes, and that's, so uh, this piece, if, if anyone wants to look it up, is called Fear of Flying, or at least a TSA while intersex. But it's very, it talks a lot about trans issues because um, actually a whole chunk of it is dissecting the way that currently doctors have started not, kind of using intersex people and denying our existence to try to hurt trans people. And so what I mean is that, you know, there is this very common sense and I think accurate assumption that if we look at the fact that sex itself is not binary, of course there's LGBTQ people, right? Because there's a spectrum from the very start. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, some of our enemies are aware of this. And so they've started putting out articles, which I, I critique in this piece I mentioned, called, and this is a direct quote from a pediatric endocrinologist, people are born male or female, period. And so I thought this article was about intersex people, but it was in fact about trans people. And he was kind of trying to say, like trying to, trying to negate our existence because people have started asking, well, it's normal to be trans, of course, because there are people born with different parts. So wouldn't people have brains also that feel differently? And there's emerging research around this. There's, it's very difficult to research around the brain, right? So it's like nothing concrete is out there. But there is a strong kind of common sense um, and, and continually scientifically reinforced belief that trans people probably have brain differences, you know, differences in their brain um, that make them feel different, you know, gender wise. And so sort of to counteract that, right, some doctors are coming out to say like, well, actually, intersex isn't a thing. And they're just these extremely rare disorders. And, and don't even try to apply that. And trans people are, are psychologically, you know, disordered as well. And so, you know, it's like they're trying to use us against each other. And so what I'm doing is trying to use us with each other. And so, for example, um, some colleagues of mine, mm. and I have discussed the bathroom issue a lot and how essentially, you know, these laws are scientifically nonsensical. They really are. Like, you can't get people. I know so many people that look incredibly female, including a supermodel that just came out as intersex, who, um, you know, she has XY male chromosomes and internal testes. So she would have to use a male restroom, according to these laws. You know, and there's so many intersex people like that, that it's like, you're going to be, you know, and as I talk about, I was using all different restrooms. And it's like, forcing people to use a restroom that matches their biological characteristics at birth doesn't work. It really doesn't work. It would create so many problems if all intersex people. So my colleagues wrote an amicus brief about that for the Gavin Grimm case. And, you know, we're really starting to unify around that because, yeah, we have very overlapping issues as adults, the trans and intersex communities. And, you know, in the TSA thing, I've been working with Lambda Legal and it's it's trans and intersex people that are complaining because we both undergo it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's actually um, a lot of strength in the coalition and I'm really excited about the coalition. And it's a, a very big focus of my activism right now. 
generation that our binary view of gender is very cultural, it's very Judeo-Christian based. Other cultures have embraced a, a spectrum over over the years, including the, the you know the first people, the Native American people. And mm -hmm. Hopefully, we can understand from those other cultures to broaden our binary view of, of gender. Totally. Um, yeah. Thank you. There's another question right here. I was just, I wanted to ask this in the most respective way, Hida. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, has somebody who's intersex um, written a text that actually gives diagrams or images of the genital variation um, that's made available to the public for parents and then adults to understand that even if they look different, they're normal? Thank you, that's a good question. Um, not an intersex person. And I think that's a good part of your you know, question. <clears throat> Obviously the medical tests exist, um, texts exist, and they're usually like really stigmatizing. There were, I actually know several adults who are the people, and they know this from their history and, and where they were at treated, treated that they are the people in the pictures where they show these these bodies and the face is blacked out and has the black over the eyes and this is horrible non-consensual use mm. of their naked pictures. Um, and so, yeah, we don't have that yet. And I mean, you know, I think it could be a really good thing. Um, yeah, for people who are more um, interested in that in that type of information. I mean, personally, you know, I would like to see it done in a really broad, humanistic way, so that it's not just like, oh, these are what intersex people look like, but it's like where this is what humans look like, right? And just like a range of all the different types of, hum you know, male, female, and intersex um, traits, you know, and bodies. Because I think that um, part of the problem that we face is that we have been kept in this really medicalized <coughs> lens. And so I've had a lot of people, you know, when I'm doing human rights activists, activism be like, well, isn't this a medical issue? Shouldn't you be approaching, you know, different medical associations and not dealing with this in a human rights context? And I'm like, actually, that would be like African Americans approaching the KKK back in the 50s. Like, no, they, these, the, the, the medical establishment are the ones that have stigmatized us the most and harmed us the most, actually. And not, you know, I'm sure not intentionally originally or whatever, but now there's so much testimony and, and they continue. And so, you know, I definitely, if something like that were out there, I would like it to be really to just broaden understanding and not have us kind of once again pinpointed, you know, as this difference in this like rare and unusual population. Yeah, thank you. So we have time for one more question. Oh, I just want to see. remind you all that oh, Hida is going to be signing books oh. in the back um, after after the Q and A. So thanks so much. Two more. <laughs> two more. Yeah. Okay, fine. Two more questions. <laughs> you know, when you spoke in in Boulder, one of the people that was in the audience, also a speaker at that symposium, <clears throat> was uh, Leonid Dunn from Liberia, and he talked about having heard you and so impressed by what you'd said because where he comes from in Liberia when a, a, an intersex child is born the child is killed because it's it's more shameful to have an intersex child than it is to have a dead baby that said because that's that's the horror that we see in this in these situations on the other side of that is Malta and I'd love to have you mention Malta ah thank you um, yeah, the situation is really grim in other parts of the world. And, and however, in 2013, there was a conference which I was uh, one of the co-organizers of, and it was in Malta, the small Mediterranean island nation. And um, because it is small, one of the people who was another co-organizer was um, had a connection with the government and is now working with the Maltese government and brought... Um, the pri one of the prime ministers of Malta to our conference. And she got to hear, Helena Dali, she got to hear all these testimonies and you know, really learn firsthand. And so uh, immediately after the conference, the other co-organizer who you know, I mentioned is, was from there and had connections, began working with her to draft legislation. And on April 1st, 2015, 
the first legislation, and there's one other country now that has it, that bans intersex genital mutilation was released. Yeah. So it's a real, real victory. And now Chile has it as well. And so it's, it's yeah, it's amazing. And it's really an example of what grassroots activism can do and can accomplish. And it was easier there because they are a small nation. Right? So you don't have as many components and things, but it's amazing. And yeah, we're, we're so, so happy about that. Thank you. Last question. Right here in the middle. I, I totally agree that parents, in a way, is where the dialogue book begins. When did your parents learn that they had an intersex child? Is it something they knew all along and they're waiting for you to discover it? And how has the kind of dialogue changed as you've evolved and become kind of a, a symbol of we have fluid gender end of conversation globally? Hmm. Yeah, so that's a very complicated question um, for my kind of personal background. So I'll just say like quickly, you know, although my parents, I'm so blessed they spared me from these procedures, they were once again Latino immigrants from a really sexist culture that did not discuss genitals, sex, sexual orientation, anything like that. So there was no discussion. Um, later on, and there's a really, <laughs> yeah, and there's a powerful chapter in the book <laughs> about right. how, um, how I had to have the conversation with my mother who was literally denying that I was intersex. And I ended up doing a show, like, like stripping for her, like, like forcing her to take a look to admit that I was intersex because she was in this denial and saying like, well, no, you're a normal girl. And so I think that, you know, I think that what parents, the beautiful thing is that if parents today, right, because this was, I grew up in the 70s, I was born in 68, right? So it's a totally different climate than today. Um, I think that today, um, most parents educate their children about anatomy. At least that's what I've seen with, with many parents. And so kids are growing up with an awareness. So I think um, the conversation, my favorite is a, someone I know who is also intact and his parents explained that he was different, you know, right around the time he was entering first grade. And they said, you know, you're, you're kind of special. You're kind of like Superman. And you know, you have these special differences and, and um, and he really took that in and he's so <laughs> he is so confident and uh, he's in this one documentary which I really recommend called Intersection um, and it's Intersex ION and um, and he says yeah I've, I've never been single for any appreciable amount of time <laughs> and it's <laughs> and so you know he really just took in you know I think that there's a way that you can explain to children that they're different and it's positive and I think that that's the best thing that a parent could do, you know, and, and just, but you have to believe it, right? Because children are extremely percep perceptive. So I think that that's, you know, what I encourage people, like, if you really believe that all humans are equal and, you know, and you don't have these prejudices against certain traits, then just instill that on your child and it will go an incredibly long way. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Yeah.